Well, we have been going through the book of Psalms. In fact, I technically should say the five books of Psalms. Most people don't realize that it's really five books. We tend to treat it as one book. And, uh, and of course, we're finishing the fifth of the five books this evening with just a few left over from our, our uh, uh, reviews. And I can tell you very candidly that of all the 66 books of the Bible that we've explored expositionally, in some respects, this book is the most frustrating. Because, in general, you can take a gospel or one of the prophets or one of the historical books, and by spending a few hours with a, a good collection of commentaries, you can get to the point where you think pretty much you understand the passage. I won't say exhaustively, but you, at least you're, you're at closure on it. You've highlighted the things, that, the controversial aspects, where there's a couple of different prevailing views on some ambiguous things, whatever. But you can get closure. You can get to the point where you feel that you can reasonably, uh, uh, competently uh, present that book to a, study, to a group or something. The book of Psalms defies that because the book of Psalms is not an expositional, uh, expositionally, uh, it doesn't lend itself to exposition uh, easily. Uh, it is really a devotional book. And as you go through the uh, acres of books written about the Psalms, of course, most of what's written is devotional tangents, explorations, um, and what it has meant to various ma famous people through history and so forth. You can never get your arms around it. Simplistically, the, book, the, the Psalms look pretty direct and simple. Praise God for this and thank you for that. And it's, it's in, a, in, to, in, in one sense, sort of straightforward. And yet, it is just chock full of discoveries and surprises to the one that immerses in it. And so, the proper way to have taken the Psalms is to spend a whole session on each one and really um, savor it digest it, and so forth. But again, it's not really a group effort. It's very much a personal thing. You need to do that for yourself. So what we've really done is we've sort of surfed it. We've gone through and touched on them, highlighted a few things that may not be obvious, um, tried to refrain from uh, belaboring the obvious, um, but um, uh, still, it's a frustrating experience because you never get the feeling of complete closure. It's been full of delights with discoveries here and there, and yet uh, yeah, it's not the kind of a study where you really feel you've mastered it in any way. And not that you, not there isn't, not that there, that's probably true to some extent of every book in the Bible. There's no book in the Bible you can really exhaust because uh, you can take even the small, you take the book of Ruth. I've taught that book probably a hundred times through the th last 30 years. And every time I go through, I make a new discovery of something I didn't know before. It's inexhaustible. And of course, the Gospel of John, another example. They often say it's shallow enough for a child to wade in and it's deep enough for an elephant to bathe in. It depends who you are, how deep it goes. It's not as, it looks very simple when you first read it, but then as you get into it, you realize it has depths and subtleties that are literally ex uh, inexhaustible. Well, so that's probably true of every book in the Bible, but the book of Psalms is probably uh, the collection that becomes most dear to the reader that takes the Bible seriously. The people who, who really get into the book of Psalms end up... Uh, 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 finding it an, an endearment that is uh, second to none. Many, many of the great people of the past uh, that know their Bible, that have been in the Bible, will put the book of Psalms as number one on their list of, of, of uh, passions and so on. So it's a, uh, it's a difficult book to really try to exposit, if you will. But in any case, we're completing the book by taking the last half a dozen of these. And uh, so let's just jump in to Psalm 145. This is the last psalm of the 150 that mentions David as the author. This psalm is also acrostic. That is, each verse starts with a different le letter of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, except this one is known because there's a missing letter. In the, if we went through this, you discover it that when you get to the nun, which is sort of like the Hebrew, what we call, it, what we call an N, uh, it is missing. That verse, there isn't, you know, it, it seems to be, it's, it's as if a verse has been dropped out, and some scholars suspect that's what it is. But it's interesting, there are other scholars 
that by the tone of the thing that have studied it deeply, suspect that it was deliberate, that it was intended to communicate that the fullness of praise is incomplete without other voices. Now, that can be a rationalization or it can be an insight, depending on your point of view. And F. W. Grant is one of the authors that highlights it, that, who highlighted that possibility. But again, it, since we're not experts in Hebrew, and so much of the structure and the subtleties and the beauty of the Psalms is lost in translation, be that as it may. So, uh, okay. This is the last one of David, or at least attributed to David, David's psalm of praise. In fact, all these last psalms are psalms of praise. The last five are literally called the, the Hallel's, the Hallelujah Psalms, the Hallelujah Psalms. But in any case, David's psalm of praise. I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. You know, it says it all. How, there's no way I can exhaust what that might mean unless I wanted to spend an hour making a sermon on it, which one could easily could. On the other hand, uh, it says it all. Pretty straightforward. The psalmist says, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. No surprise. After all, he's God. But as we go here, we want to continue to remind ourselves these were intended to be sung in Hebrew. So we missed that, of course, in the translation because uh, it, 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 Hebrew is a very different kind of a language. But uh, at the same time, um, it's not hard for us to grasp the poetry that is uh, embedded in the language. Um, One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. Indeed, isn't that our task? It's not only to praise God, but to teach our children and our children's children to do so. One generation shall praise thy works to another. How tragic it is that our young people, in general, have absolutely no grasp of the Bible. The biblical illiteracy in our culture is astonishing. And, and the reason it is so... Uh, terrible is because we're terrible. How many of us really know our Bible well enough to teach our kids? How many of us really, that may know our Bible, take the effort and the time to really train our kids? I'm not looking for a show of hands, <laughs> but you get what I'm get, trying to get at here. One generation will praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. And before you get too comfortable, consider how long has it been since you declared God's acts to someone in your family or elsewhere. He, the promise continues, I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. You know, it's interesting. Many of us know our Bible, may even have some friends where we talk about it a lot and all that, but do we really speak in the sense of honoring God and his majesty? Do we dwell on that or do we take it for granted? I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of that. And yet, I have to admit that every time I eat something at a dinner or in a, in a snack or something, more often than not, I'm overwhelmed to realize how complex our digestion is. It might sound like a funny thing to talk about, but, but uh, it's amazing as you survey our world, whether it's in the vegetable realm or, or lettuce or fruit or that in that realm, or whether it's some, an animal that's then, then prepared for, for a feast. The variety of materials that make up what we take in is enormous, and yet our body is able to, s to sift out those peculiar things it needs and not just the carbohydrates, not just to make the sugars or the energy, but even the trace elements, the manganese or zinc or whatever, uh, it can select out what it, ne it needs and pass on what it doesn't need. And what a complex chemistry is involved. What a complex system 
to, uh, uh, the body and its marriage to the environment to, to be able to, uh, uh, to, to recognize not only is the body incredibly designed, but it's designed, and the environment that it's been put in has been designed in a, an amazing way. And as you look at all that, it's hard not to stand back in awe of the skill of the designer. Not only to design it so it all works, but to maintain it. The hundreds of mathematical ratios that have to be held precisely to one part in several million uh, to make it all continue to stay working, is it's not only designed, it's maintained. And it's astonishing. And how often do we pause, though, to really share that with our friends or whatever? I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous work. And boy, they are, you know, it's absolutely bewildering to me that we can live in a culture that insists upon denying that these are wondrous works. A culture that attributes them to random accidents. You know, that's the height of absurdity. That is the denial of what the very definition of information. Information is, according to Shannon, is the surprise value of data. If something comes down the channel that's exactly predictable, it has zero data. The data it is, is how much is it a surprise? If I'm about to alter a number and you know the number I'm going to say is three, that gives you no information. If I say four, oh, it's a surprise that there's some, it, it, can, be, it can be meaningful. Uh, they measure information by its non-predictability. Randomness is the absence of information. And... Uh, it means it's the absence of design, and we in our culture attribute design to the absence of design. Now, do you think that's a little illogical? It's a definition of illogic. Anyway, let's move on. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. So there's allusion here of God inter intervening in man's history in terrible, the word really is awesome. It doesn't have to mean frightening, as we, tend, we tend, treat terrible as a negative thing. The, the, the English word actually means it's, it, it, it strikes awe. Yes, it can be terror, but it can also be just uh, uh, awe and wonder, in, the, in the sense of wonder. Men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness, and shall sing of thy righteousness indeed. Whew. Okay. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. That may ring familiar in the ears because those phrases are all through the Torah, all through the Scripture. The Lord is gracious. Anyone here not know that? But do we dwell on it? Do we really appreciate it? He's full of compassion. You know, it's amazing that we have such a God. Islam does not have such a God. Even in the conception, recognizing it's not really God, but they think it is, or they, they, they act like they do. Uh, the, 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 the Allah of Islam is capricious, unpredictable, one to be feared. You never know what he's going to do. He can do anything, as their literature continues to hammer. That's not the God of the Old Testament. That's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov. The God of the Old Testament delights in making and keeping promises. He's trustworthy. But interestingly enough, not only that, he's full of compassion. We have a compassionate God who is slow to anger. Does he anger? Absolutely. And of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power. To make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. The Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all those that are bound down. He knows our every need. Every need we might have, he knows before we even ask. But he does help those that call upon him. James, the brother of our Lord, in his letter in the New Testament, points out, you have not because ye ask not. Same basic concept in front of us here. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. And uh, 
Thou openest thine, um, <clears throat> thine hand and satisfieth the desire of every living thing. It's interesting as you go into the wild, you see the, the chain of life. God provides them every meat in due season. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. You know, as I think about animals, you know, it's really interesting because, you know, in the millennium, we understand that the lion and the lamb are going to lay down together. Things are going to be different. Of course, the lion and the lamb lay down together now. The lamb is inside the lion, but they're, you know, okay, yeah, right. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. That's quite a sentence. There are many people that doubt that. The Lord is righteous in all his ways. We may not understand them. And holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh, near, unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. Have you called on him lately? Has he answered? He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, and all the wicked will he destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. You know, one of the great doctrines that came out of the Reformation is the, the, the reminding of ourselves that, uh, of the priesthood of believers. In the Old Testament, they accessed God through the high priest. You and I are a kingdom of priests. One of the astonishing things that we take, we, we, we take for granted, but we shouldn't, is that we have direct access to him. And indeed, he can hear us and fulfill us if we will indeed call upon him. Let all flesh bless his, holy, bless his holy name forever and ever. Okay, Psalm 146. Now, this is the first of the last five. And the last five are called the Hallelujah Psalms. And uh, they conclude this hymn book. And uh, the, 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 uh, and all, all five are what they call Hallelujah Psalms. They begin with praise the Lord. And how do you say praise the Lord in Hebrew? Hallelujah. Hallelujah as an abbreviated form for Yahweh, the yod heh vav -Heh. And uh, so, uh, so each one of these five start with hallelujah, and they end with hallelujah. And uh, these psalms now will no longer speak of the persecution and suffering. There are no prayers in this group to, cause for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, to call for deliverance from an enemy. All these themes that we've been hearing all through the other uh, 145 psalms in one way or another, in, you know, the, the, the persecution or the oppression or the, uh, the, uh, the anguish or the uh, uh, imprecatory, you know, uh, calling down upon vengeance on enemies and, and all that sort of thing. Weeping is past. Joy has now taken hold. And so these are going to have that all in common. They're hallelujah psalms. They are like a crescendo climaxing the 150, uh, 145 that have preceded us. And so the hallelujah psalms. Psalm 106 is also a hallelujah psalm back there. Psalms 111, 112, 113 were called, had hallelujah characteristics. Psalm 135 did. But this group uh, all these can be called hallelujah, hallelujah psalms, but when they use that in the plural, they're usually referring to 146 through 150, the last five, although that term is also used from 111, 12, and 13 because they have these characteristics. So when someone says, which are the hallelujah psalms, you actually have some choices. But typically, they're pointing to these last five uh, that belong uh, uh, in, in, to the uh, last book. And what they are is really, in effect, a short course on worship. These five are sometimes looked upon as a short course upon worship. 146 will focus on a vow of lifetime praise. The psalmist takes a vow of praising God for the rest of his life. 147 focuses on how good and pleasant it is to praise God. When we praise God, we benefit. We benefit. It shouldn't surprise us, but most people don't think of that. One of the reasons you praise God is to exalt yourself because it's, a, it, it's, a, it's an exalting or raising up kind of thing. Psalm 148 
focus on having the whole creation join in in our praise. Join, or we should put, join the creation in praise. Everything praises God. The creation does. And that's a challenge to be sensitive to that. 149 is jo worship joyfully. Worship is not onerous. It is not somber. It is joyful. It's exciting. It's uplifting. And then, of course, the last one is the where, when, and how we worship. And it has the climactic phrase, everything that has breath should praise the Lord. Anybody in here with breath? Then you should be praising the Lord, right? Okay, good. Okay. So uh, now, let's take the first one, 146 from 1 to 4. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord, O my soul. Praise ye the Lord, of course, is hallelujah. While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. While I have any existence at all. That's even beyond lifetime. That's also into the afterlife, as we might use the term. The psalmist says, while I live, will I praise the Lord. Boy, we need to do that. It's our highest calling. It's what we were created for. There's nothing we can do that is more, uh, has a higher priority in our uh, horizon than praising God. Do we bother? I won't ask for a show of hands, but you might just examine yourself. Do we focus any attention or prioritization on just stopping to praise Him? When we get to the end, we'll make some remarks about worship near the end. But, you know, it's interesting, in reading on this a little bit, it was highlighted to me that there is no such thing as public worship. We talk about public worship, meaning we're going to do it as a group. And, and that, I'm not saying that doesn't exist, but real worship is a personal thing. You might be in a crowd doing it too, but you're doing it. Real worship is personal. It is private. It is intimate. And it is, it is uh, committed. While I live, will I praise the Lord? I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man in whom there is no help. Sounds like the psalmist was listening to some of our campaign speeches. <laughs> I don't know about you, and I'm not here to, to pick on any particular person, but I think it's a sorry lot, a bunch of them. It's astonishing to me that a culture that's been as blessed as ours has to serve up such a dismal cast of alternatives as we approach our, uh, a critical election in our history. I mean, these are a band of losers. Virtually, not maybe not every one, but practically. I mean, th this, as, a, as a, a segment of our society, it's discouraging. And, that, it, and it's in them that our hope is to rest? Hardly. Hardly. We can easily claim this psalm we do not put our trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. Indeed, indeed, the problems we face are problems that even a hero could not handle, because our, the problems facing our, our leadership is really challenging. It would be challenging for really serious statesmen, not the shoddy self-serving politicians that typically uh, line up to exploit the media time they have and so forth. Anyway, put not your trust in princes nor in the son of man in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth and he returneth to his earth and his thoughts perish. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. You know, it's interesting. Don't take for granted the God of Yaakov the God of Israel, the living God. Most people on the earth do not worship the living God. They create alternatives that they're more comfortable with. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord, his God. Indeed, we should be happy that we serve a living God, not a synthetic one, not not a false god, not a god of deceit and falsehood. We have the god of Jacob, the god of Israel. 
for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that therein is, which keepeth truth forever. Wow. Something to keep in mind. He made everything we know. He made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that therein is, which keepeth truth forever. That's not trivial. He really did. Which executeth judgment for the oppressed, which giveth food to the hungry. The Lord looseth his prisoners. Indeed, that's what we're celebrating when we get to the what we call the Easter season. I should say the Passover and the Resurrection Sunday that he loosed the prisoners. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous. The Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked, he turneth upside down. Praise God. The Lord shall reign forever, even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations. Praise ye the Lord. In the closing verses of this psalm, the Lord, meaning yod heh vav -Heh, or Yahweh, or Jehovah, whatever tradition you want to synthesize there, Yahweh is mentioned eight times in the closing verses of the psalm. Where it says the Lord in your English translation, that's usually the rendering of what in the Hebrew would be yod heh vav -Heh, the four letters that the tetragrammaton. And uh, sometimes translated Yahweh and, uh, or Jehovah, which is really a corruption of the German, Jehovah. But in any case, whatever. Okay, let's go to Psalm 147. This is also obviously a hallelujah psalm. Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant, and praise is comely. Indeed it is. Praise is not an onerous task. It's not something we sort of do because it's our duty. No, it's good. It's a joy. For it is good to sing praises unto our God. For it is pleasant and praise is comely. Why don't we do it more? Whenever we do it, it's a pickup. Why don't we? Well, I'm dragging today. Try it and see what happens to your day that's so down. <laughs> the Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathered together the outcasts of Israel. Why is that good news for us? It's obviously good news for Israel. Why is it good news for us? Because it tells us what time it is on God's calendar. You want to know what time it is on God's calendar? You don't read a book on prophecy? Go see what's happening to Israel. Because the scenario is written in advance. It's ups and downs and so forth. And the Lord is building up Jerusalem. And what happens when you build up Jerusalem? Check Psalm 121 and some of the others if you remember. The Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathereth together the outcasts of Israel. He healeth the broken heart and he bindeth up their wounds. He telleth the number of the stars. Wow. He calleth them all by their names. You know, one thing about this that you don't pick up in the English is the frequency of participles. That's the ings, the building up, the gathering, the healing, the binding is the way it is actually in the Hebrew. These are participles. They imply continuous action. They, the, the, the intent of that grammatical structure is continuing action. So he's building, he's gathering, he's healing, he's binding up their wounds. He's telling the number and so forth. These, there's an action thing here that you miss in, in, the, in the politeness of the, of the English here. And uh, so, uh, but this verse 4 is a fact. He telleth the number of the stars. How many stars are there? The billions and billions. We don't have numerics that can really embrace them. We have estimates, but they're wild. The numbers that if you tried to render them in a lecture, you, 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 have, you have no ability to grasp the size, the number of stars in a single galaxy, let alone the fact that the number of galaxies is a number. I mean, it, goes, it, gets, it gets crazy. But the number is so vast that we don't have a number to embrace it on the one hand, and yet he has a name for each one. That's, um, from an information science point of view, staggering. That goes beyond, beyond. Uh -huh. He telleth the number of the stars. Wow, okay. He calleth them all by their names. They have names. I wonder why. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is finite. No. His understanding is what? Infinite. You know... That's a word we bandy about a lot, especially in mathematics classes. But do you want to know something? 
that you cannot find infinity in the physical universe? There are two things that are concepts in mathematics that are well-defined that you cannot find in the physical universe. One of them is infinity. Well, the universe is infinite. No, it's not. The great discovery of 20th century science was that the universe is finite, both in its macrocosm, that in its, its outside size, it's also finite in its smallness. When you get down to a certain smallness, you can't make it half that size anymore. Up till then, you can take whatever you got and cut it in half and take what's left and cut it and you keep doing that. Uh-uh. You get to a point where, there's a, where you get to an indivisible a unit that can't be divided, whether it's length, mass, time, energy. They all have Planck length. They all have, that's why they call it quantum physics, because when you try to divide it, that the thing that you're dividing suddenly is everywhere at one time. It's, it lacks locality, they say, whatever that means. Now, um, so the universe is, we can't find infinity. We can conceive of it, and it's a useful concept in certain kind of theoretical constructions in mathematics, but you can't find infinity in, real, in the real world, in, the, in what we call reality. And uh, so the other, no, the other thing you can't find, surprisingly, is randomness. Not true randomness. Because whatever you think is random probably has gotten there by some process, therefore it's not random. So randomness is also an elusive boundary. So you have infinity on the one sense and randomness, and, and both of those are unreachable by man. Because we live in a virtual reality, not a real reality. That's the conclusion of the... the uh, uh, of, of, people who study these kinds of things. Anyway, so his understanding, God's is infinite. I was asked on an interview today, I, I, you know, I'm a radio interviewer, and, and, and the guy was asking the question, you know, why did God, you know, create man when he knew that it was going to be so sinful and so much pain and suffering? Why did he do that? And the answer, of course, is because to, to God is interested in demonstrating his infiniteness. Now, infinite power we can sort of imagine from astronomy. Infinite knowledge we can sort of imagine because he knows everything. But how do you demonstrate infinite love? How does God... And, and, and that's really what this whole drama is all about. Because God knew that by creating man and giving him free will, man would get himself into a predicament that only the death of God himself would prevail to get him out of that mess to demonstrate infinite love. And that's exactly what Paul mentions in Ephesians 2. We all quote Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are ye saved through faith and so forth. We missed the verse before that. So that, he, so, he can demonstrate, so that in ages yet to come, he can demonstrate his love through our riches in Christ and so forth. So anyway, so God's understanding is infinite and his love is infinite. And that's what we're participating is, is his demonstration of just how far he will go to give us eternal life, if we will but accept it. The Lord lifteth up the meek. What is the meek? We use that term all the time. Well, that's just sort of a quiet guy. No, what is meek? It's power under control. Power under control. The Lord lifteth up the meek. He casteth the wicked down to the ground. Praise God. Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praise upon the harp unto our God. We're going to notice that these, some, there's a lot of instruments Playing instruments is a good idea. All through here, we're going to find, there's, here's a harp, we're going to find all kinds of uh, elude. And don't miss that, that instruments are good. There are a lot of people that, you know, get so pious, we don't know we want instruments in the sanctuary. No, yeah, well, anyway. No, I, I, I better stop on that one. Let's go on. Uh, who covereth the heaven with clouds, who prepareth the rain for the earth, who maketh grass to grow upon the mountains. He giveth to the beast his food and to the young ravens which cry. A strange concept about ravens. You know, the ancients believed that ravens were abandoned by their parents and had to find food on their own. And uh, that's what even it's, uh, 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 in Luke chapter 12, we find the phrase, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse or barn, but God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? That, but see, again, it's dwelling on this notion that the ravens have to fend for themselves. See, the common belief among some is that ravens had to find, were abandoned by parents, had to, they're on their own. They're just like orphans in that sense. And, and uh, it's even sort of under, uh, undergirds the, that remark in Luke 12. But anyway, uh, and to the ravens which cry. So in other words, okay, so let's, uh, granting this 
belief, whether it's true or not, the point is God provides for them too. He delighteth not in the strength of the horse. Gee, I do. But uh, he delighteth not in the strength of the horse. He taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. I'm pausing because I, uh, I think every father that has daughters that ha ends up with, with some discretionary income gets tangled up in horses. You know, uh, yeah. uh, uh, girls like horses between the toys and the boys, right? And so, and, uh, so uh, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm one of these guys that like my horses 300 at a time under a hood. That's where they belong. <laughs> but anyway... <laughs> Which reminds me of the guy that missed his wedding anniversary and his wife was really upset. Says, if, there, if tomorrow morning there isn't something in the driveway that goes from zero to 206 seconds, you're in big trouble. The next morning she gets up, looks out the window, and there's a box with a ribbon on it out in the driveway. Puts on her bathrobe, goes out there and opens the box, and it was a bathroom scale. <laughs> They, they tell me that he's not accepting visitors yet. <laughs> anyway, back to work. Sorry about that. Okay. He taketh not the pleasure in the legs of a man or of the silly stories that some teachers throw into the thing. Sorry, I apologize. Okay. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. Indeed, we hope for his mercy. We don't relish his justice. We want mercy, not justice. And I think all of you, of course, are, are, are familiar with the difference between grace and mercy. Grace is uh, getting what we don't deserve, and mercy is not getting what we do, right? But uh, praise the Lord, O Jerusalem, praise thy God, O Zion, for he hath strengthened the bars of thy gates, he hath blessed the thy children within thee. He maketh peace in thy borders and filleth thee with the finest of the wheat. Indeed. He sendeth forth his commandment upon the earth. His word runneth very swiftly. Boy, his word does run swiftly. You know, it's fascinating to study history and realize that the Reformation that changed the face of the earth did not occur because Martin Luther nailed 95 theses to the door in Wittenberg. That was a triggering event, but that's not why it happened. The reason it could go like wildfire through Europe because a guy in the neighborhood invented a printing press. The Gutenberg press made possible the Reformation. We overlooked that because the Word of God now could be in every man's hands. And that's what helped get the Word from the cloisters into the uh, homes. Same thing's going on today. Same thing's going on today. This thing called internet. That you can, with a couple of punches of the keys, draw up more resources than populate the libraries of most seminaries. You can travel with a thing in your lap on a plane that carries more word searchable books than. Uh, populate most libraries. The resources available to every person where you can get at the Word of God in the original language without knowing the original language. You do not have to know Hebrew or Greek in order to use Hebrew and Greek. The computer will diagram the sentences for you. You put your little arrow on any word in the English and it'll tell you what lies behind it in the Hebrew or the Greek or whatever. The power of the tools that are available and the good... There are fabulous ones that are free. They cost zero. And you want to avail yourself of those. The Blue, the Blue Letter Bible on the Internet. Incredible resource. It's free. eSword for your computer. Incredible package. Now, there are other packages, too, that are very elaborate and expensive, and I'm not knocking them. They're, they have their features. But the point is, the resources are astounding. As a student of, of markets, I'm amazed that the marketplace for biblical helps is so large and so viable 
that there are a handful of major vendors. Usually in a, a narrow market, a specialized market, there's one or two dominant vendors that quickly own it because it's a narrow market. No, in the biblical helps world, there are a handful of major suppliers plus dozens of other competent specialty. It's amazing the vitality of that marketplace. And some of the greatest tools are free. So you want to do it. He, God, he sendeth forth his commandment upon the earth. His word runneth very swiftly. Boy, it sure does. There's no excuse for anyone to have any ignorance of the word of God. He giveth snow like wool. He gathereth the hoarfrost like ashes. Now, I don't know about you, but I had to look that up. <laughs> what on earth is hoarfrost? It comes from the Latin meaning rug of fire. It resembles the fine gray uh, ash of wood was burned in the open air. So it's sometimes lo- the, the frost looks like ashes because it darkens light, resembles the color in them, and it has a kind of burning in it. So it's a term that that's why the hoarfrost is likened to ashes. That's really what that, 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 that's that about. Anyway, he casteth forth his ice-like morsels. Who can stand before his cold? <laughs> Let Napoleon answer that question. He didn't do his homework about the Scythians. He entered Russia with 450,000 of his grand armée and was lucky to leave with less than 10,000. He found out what, that the Russians invented winter. <laughs> <laughs> he sent out his word and melteth them. He causeth the wind to blow and the waters to flow. He showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation. Boy, that's a thought. There is no other nation on the earth that can claim that they are in possession of the word of God in the sense that Israel can. We're all indebted to them. He hath not dealt so with any nation. And as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord. Boy, boy, boy. Okay, Psalm 148, another hallelujah psalm. Praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. You know, Solomon um, said, uh, Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee of God. He was, you know, speaking of the temple, he's, he, he, while he built the temple and was glad to do it, he recognized that that can't contain God. Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. Heaven of heaven, that's a strange term, isn't it? See, again, the, the, the general understanding of this is that there were three heavens. The first heaven is where the, heaven, the, the air the birds fly in. The, ne- the second heaven where, where the stars are. The heaven of heavens is the next one. It's a, it's another, it's a hyperspace uh, type of allusion, if you will. And so Paul uses that phrase. I went, I, you know, the third, he speaks of the third heaven. Same. The heaven of heavens is generally regarded the Hebrew equivalent of what the Greeks would call the third heaven. But anyway... Um, Praise him, all ye angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. What is he talking about hosts? The hosts of God. Who? Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Praise him, ye heaven of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Wow. Let them... Praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. All these things are created out of information, and the information is what he spoke. They were created. He spoke them into existence. He hath also established them forever and ever. He made a decree which shall not pass, that is, pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons, all ye deeps. Fire and hail, and snow and vapor, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. And the word, the word actually for fire can mean lightning or volcanoes, depending on how you want to uh, treat it. But uh, in any case, okay. Mountains and the hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth and all people, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children. 
He did it all. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. He also exalteth the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, even the children of Israel, a people near unto him. Praise ye the Lord. Now the word horn here deserves a quick comment. He also exalteth the horn of his people. Now the word horn is intended to communicate authority or power. The horn, of course, of an animal was representative of his strength or power and his protection and, his, and so forth. So the horn is used idiomatically here to mean authority or power. And it usually is also used to mean of a king or whoever the leader of a people is. He also exalted the horn of his people. Now, this can only be Christ. And remember what the... Uh, Angel promised Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 30 to 33, that her child would sit on David's throne. He would be the horn of his people. At the time Gabriel told that to Mary, there was no one on David's throne. There was a Roman appointee of an Edomite, an enemy of Israel. Edom was an enemy of Israel. Herod was an Idumean or an Edomite. They haven't had a horn of their people on a throne to this day from then. He also exalted the horn of his people. Who is the psalmist alluding to whether he realizes it or not? Jesus Christ. He also exalted the horn of his people. Indeed, indeed. The praise of all his saints. Uh huh. Even the children of Israel, a people near unto him. Praise ye the Lord. Wow. Okay, now we have Psalm 149. It's a little primer on worship in, its, in and of itself. All five are, but Psalm 149 is a, is, is a little a nugget here. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Really? David did. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and the harp. Now, timbrel is probably something very close to what we think of as a tambourine. Different kinds, but that kind of thing. And a harp. Notice all the instruments emerging here. Okay, dance and timbrels and a harp. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their couches. It says beds here, but it's in the sense of a, a, a social gathering, a couch. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. Ooh, wait a minute. This is getting a little rough here. To bind their kings with chains. Oh, devoutly to be wished. <laughs> and their nobles with fetters of iron. To execute upon them the judgment written, this honor have all his saints. Praise the Lord. You know, we got to keep in mind something that people overlook. When Jesus comes back to this earth, he's not going to be welcomed. The earth is not excited about it. That's what Psalm 2 in the, in the lead off of these things, in, back there in Psalm 2, dealt with. You know? The, the, you know, that the uh, kings of the earth take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let's cast their bounds asunder. You've got to be kidding. See, Jesus is coming back to judge the earth. He came back as a suffering servant last time. This time, he has a different agenda. In fact, the mandate that he read in Isaiah chapter one, uh, 61, verses 1 and 2, that he read in the synagogue of Nazareth, remember he stopped at a comma. He didn't finish that passage. He stopped that comma and closed the book and says, this day is this fulfilled in your ears. The part he didn't read continued saying, and the day of vengeance of our God, that is yet future, and that's coming. He's going to come back to judge the earth. And uh, thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. And... Uh, in judgment thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel, and so forth. You and I 
are living in a world that is heading for Judgment Day. I'm not saying it's a week from Tuesday, don't misunderstand me, but uh, it is coming. And as you get sensitive to what God is doing, you sense that it is on its way. Okay, last one. Now, each of the previous books of Psalms, remember we said there are five books of Psalms, right? Each of the four, previous four books of Psalms, book one, book two, book three, book four, had closed with a benediction. Psalm 41, the last verses 13, was a benediction. In the second book, Psalm 72, verses 18 and 19, were a benediction. In the third book, Psalm 89, verse 52, was a benediction. And the previous, Psalm 106, verse 48. In other words, the last verse or two of each of the four books had a benediction. This is the end of not only book five, but the book of Psalms. So the whole Psalm is a benediction, in effect, okay? The whole, the whole Psalm is devoted to praise. Let me be more precise. There are only six verses in it, and there are 13 hallelujahs in it. Get the message? <laughs> okay. So, let's go ahead. Praise ye the Lord. What's that in Hebrew? Hallelujah. Okay. Uh, that's the covenant name of God. And uh, that's what it looks like in Hebrew. Remember, it goes, he, all letters go towards Jerusalem. And so it goes from right to left. And uh, hallelujah. First, and then the then uh, Yah, and if you know the tetragonum Yod He Vav He, it's a Yod and a He. The Vav He is implied in effect, okay. But it's the covenant name for God in contrast to El, because it, it says praise you Lord, praise God. The way that's translated in English, what they really mean Hallu El El the the creation name of God. Praise ye the Lord, the covenant name. Praise God in His sanctuary, the Creator in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of... Oh, yeah, by the way, this is Hallelujah. And the Yah is the German Yah, J, if you will, okay, in a sense, the way, way we might put it. We, th we say J, but the, it's here in this use, use it's implied like as it, it was Y-A-H. Hallelujah. Yah, the, which is a, an abbreviated covenant name for God. Okay. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the psaltery and the harp. Whew. Makes you really wonder what kind of instruments they had. You know, there's a lot of research going on. A lot of people have it, but we, we really don't know. We know something about those things, but not nearly enough. I got a lot of questions from people that are in music, and, and I'm, I'm not uh, up to speed on that. I think there are people who are very serious study, students of the Bible that know music that may have some insights that I, 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 haven't, I haven't read up in that area. I'm not competent to really add something to that. I'm sure there is some, some research, but I haven't found it in the normal commentaries. Praise Him with timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high-sounding cymbals. There's two different kinds. And let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. That's sort of a catch-all. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. You know, I think that includes trees, because we know the trees, the trees clap their hands. I think it's, it's here, and it's intended to be all... It's not breathing like lungs. It's, it's an all-expressive uh, concept, I believe. Praise ye the Lord. Let everything that hath breath, breath praise the Lord. So there we are. We've done it. Let's talk a little bit about worship, though. That's what this is all about. What is worship? We use that term a lot. What is it really? Well, the one answer is Psalm 150. Praise ye the Lord. That's worship. Praise what? Ye the Lord. He is the Creator. That's what we praise Him for. He's also the Redeemer. You know, it's important to understand that there's two primary roles that God has presented in, in throughout the Scripture. He's obviously the creator of the universe, and we could spend a whole hour, you know, amplifying that one. And, of course, he's also the dreamer. Which one is more important? Well, that's a tough question. Well, how do you tell what's more important? Well, one way to tell is how much of the Scripture is devoted to that role. Well, God is the creator. Let's talk about that. Gee, that's the, well, we've got the book of Genesis, a couple of chapters. 
Uh, we've got a couple of chapters in Job. We've got a few chapters in Isaiah. And, of course, some allusions all through. But uh, that's the, that pretty well summarizes what we think we know about him as a creator. Well, what about Redeemer? What, how much of the Bible is devoted to his act of redemption? Most of the book of Genesis, actually. Certainly the book of Exodus. That's what it's really all about. That, Leviticus, that's the procedure, that's the specifications. And, and, and even Numbers and Deuteronomy can be portrayed that way. And as you suddenly realize... We, the history of Israel is, is one of their being redeemed and their need for continual re-needing of that. Uh, then we have, the, of course, the, the uh, prophets. It's all about redemption. That's what the Gospels are all about and the epistles. I mean, wow, okay. Most of the Bible is about redemption. Another way to decide which one's more important is what did it cost him? Well, he created the universe. He called it, you know, with the breath of his nostrils. I'm not demeaning it, but it sounds like he could do it again without too much sweat, huh? What did the redemption cost him? His son. Very expensive. Anyway, so thoughts on that. The question is, okay, who is to worship? See, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. There's no other reason for, God, for a man's existence. There's no other reason for a man's existence. And that again is Psalm 150. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. I think that's you and me, right? Praise ye the Lord. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. When the morning stars sang together, at the very creation, the, 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 uh, the, the sons of God, the term here in the Hebrew means the angels. They sang together and shouted for joy. <coughs> Psalm 96 says, For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Different category. Okay, who is to worship? Why do we worship? Well, we, to praise ye the Lord. There are three major words. Prostration. You see, uh, 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 worship is an active of, uh, uh, public, excuse me, it is actually a private action, not a public one. We may do it in public, but the real worship is a private. Uh, uh, public worship is really almost an oxymoron. And uh, so the, one of the aspects of worship is prostration. At least emotionally and soul-wise, we should be flat on our face. The, the other, uh, uh, proskuneo in the Hebrew, it means to bow the knee. Adoration is what it's all about. Adoration is a term of endearment. It's a love affair. This is not an intellectual exercise. It's a passion thing. And... Uh, the third word to be aware of, prostration, adoration, is ex exaltation, and surprisingly enough, not of God, take that for granted, no, of ourselves. Humanism is a deadening philosophy that leads man back to the jungles. Whenever we find someone encountering God, whether it's... Uh, Joshua, at the end of Joshua 5, can, with the, which with the, what we believe is Jesus drawing a sword there, um, he falls on his face. John in Revelation falls on his face. Isaiah in Isaiah 6 falls on his face. In each case, the word is arise, fear not. There's nothing that will give more dignity to man than the sincere worship of God that distinguishes him, that disting, distinguishes him. Praise ye the Lord. Now, okay, we've been going through the book of Psalms. One of the things that we find as we go through is allusions to the character of the composition. We know the Psalms are a tefillah, that is a prayer. They're a praise. We ran into some that were called a miktam, a poem of gold. Some of the Psalms are labeled in terms of the character of this specific hymn or composition we're dealing with. Shir means a song. The Mizmor, that's a psalm to be sung with musical accompaniment. Many of them are so designated. Uh, Maskil, we saw that frequently. That's a psalm of instruction. 
That's like what some people call a didactic poem, a poem for a, whose purpose is instruction. And uh, the Shigeon is an irregular one and so forth. We talked about some of these. Many of them have annotations. Some of the objects are declared as their teaching or for thanksgiving or a call to remembrance. Uh, others had notices attached to them, a song for a Sabbath day, for Shabbat, right? Or a song of the going up. The, remember the songs of ascent from Psalm 120 to 134? They were songs of ascent. We have all these designations. And, of course, David's psalm. A lot of these were David's. Uh, 73 of the 150 are attributed to David. Some actually signed and some just attributed. But psalms of David's early life, there's 14 of those that seem to be focusing on his very early uh, 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 days. There were psalms of the earlier part of his reign in Hebron and so forth, about 19 of those. Some of the psalms of the, from the time of his great sin unto his flight from Jerusalem, Absalom's rebellion and all of that, 10 of those. Psalms of the exile uh, while he's on the run. And psalms of his last period of his reign, there's three of those. So that's one way, and there are many more that he's done that they don't really, and I have not spent a lot of time going through trying to second guess where they really fit. Some scholars have really tried to trouble themselves with that. Uh, I'm sort of underwhelmed with the arguments. doesn't mean they're wrong, but I don't see that they help us understand what the, the real present value of that psalm is today, other than maybe just background. But so we haven't, we haven't tried to emphasize some of that. But uh, there are a number of psalms that are grouped together with labels. The shepherd psalms. Remember those? Which were the shepherd psalms? Anyone remember? 22, 23, and 24. 22 is as, as, as if he was hanging on the cross. 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and so forth. And also 24. There are a group that are called the kingdom psalms. Remember those? 46, 47, 48. In fact, 45, just before that was the marriage supper of the Lamb, if you may recall. The Hallelujah Psalms. Now there are, if you if you try, there are several groups that are thus called. One eleven to one thirteen are called by some authors the Hallelujah Psalm, but certainly most uh, would designate one forty six to one fifty, the last five that we took as being the Hallelujah Psalms. The Songs of Ascent. Now this is a very important series uh, what, that they sang on the way up their their annual. Uh, or I should say their frequent pilgrimages to Israel, three times a year they would ascend up to Jerusalem. 120 to 134, those 15 psalms are known as the songs of ascent. Or, and uh, the royal psalms, 94 through 99, these are kingdom psalms, uh, prophetic ones uh, dispensationally we believe. And then there's a group, interestingly enough, that are called the Pauline Psalms. That sounds like an oxymoron because they're written in the Old Testament, and yet they are designated by several, not less than Martin Luther and others, that call four of them Pauline Psalms because they tend to focus on our sinfulness and the redemptive act of God in dealing with that. And uh, 32, 51, 130, and 143 are called by some scholars the Pauline Psalms because they echo the book of Romans in many ways. Now, which psalm, here's a little test, see how many pass. Which psalm appears as if it's written first person singular, hanging on the cross? 22, good for you. Okay. Which psalm is a trilogue, that is not a dialogue, but a trilogue, a conversation among three people on the Trinity? Which one? Psalm 2, good for you, you guys are on your toes. Which is the shortest chapter in the Bible? Ooh, I got gotcha. you. 117? Okay, you want to memorize a psalm, 117. Yeah. Okay, which one was written by Moses? There's one of them that apparently was written by Moses. Which one? Anyone? 90? Okay. Which are the three most often quoted psalms in the New Testament? And I say three because there's a little debate among some scholars which one's first or second, and I won't go down that path. Let's just take the three that are clearly among the top three quoted. 22, 69, and 110. And the issue, 69, is regarded by many scholars as the second most quoted, but they seem to have a di difference of view, and I didn't take the trouble to track down because some of these allusions are quite... Um, you know, subtle. So I didn't try to split ties between 22 and 110 for, for, for position number one. But the three are certainly frequently, frequently quoted throughout the New Testament. Okay. Which psalm implies that Judas was married and had children? This is a tiebreaker type of question. Obviously, 109. 109 
infer, we, we can infer from 109 that apparently Judas was married. That doesn't mean we're right, but we, the inference seems to be there. Uh, which psalm yields a glimpse of Christ's early years in Nazareth as a boy? Remember, we learned some surprising things that is, I don't think is recorded anywhere else in the Scripture of what a nightmare those 30 years in Nazareth really m- meant for he and his mother. And that, of course, is Psalm 69. One of the most quoted psalms in the scripture. But for other reasons, not for that reason. Which is the most darkest, doleful of all the psalms? Anyone? Oh my goodness, got you napping. 88. 88. Which is the only psalm? This is a trick question. There is a psalm that's known as the only psalm because only is in there over and over and over again. That's just, it's a sort of a... Okay, anyone? 62. That's your little one you can tuck away for your Bible study group to stump them sometime. Which one was Martin Luther's favorite hymn? Anyone? 46. 46. Okay. Which is the longest chapter in the Bible? What? 119. Good for you. And which psalm has the repetitive refrain, His mercy endureth forever? 136. 136. Which psalm, and this is an important one to really know, heralds the attributes of God like few other? 139. 139. You should be able to sit down and write an essay on the attributes of God just elaborating Psalm 139. Which psalm represents David's repentance of his sin with Bathsheba? Good for you. 51. Right on. Good. Which one is suggestive of the marriage supper of the Lamb? I told you just a few minutes ago. 45. Okay, just a little fun. Now for your next session, I'd like you to consider, since you'll have a little break, I'm sure, undertake a systematic commitment to the Psalms for your life. I won't spell it out. You design your own, read a psalm a day, however you want to do it. There's all kinds of ways. But I'm going to suggest that you immerse yourself in the psalms. And I'm not sure I'd try to absorb all of them, but I would find those that you respond to and really immerse yourself in those. In fact, you might want to memorize those that are the most dear to you. I gather from a study of history that that turns out to be one of the most precious things in the lifetime of many of the great leaders of of history to do that. And then the next thing, of course, you can choose the next book to explore, expositionally, verse by verse. Don't stop now. We've gone through Psalms, great. But from here, you go on and pick a book, go through it verse by verse, but whatever mechanisms you find comfortable. If you're good at self-study, just do it on your own. If you tend to benefit by being part of a small group, either face-to-face or on the internet, by all means do that. But continue a systematic commitment to the Word of God. And I don't mean just devotionally. The Psalms are devotional. I'm talking about expositionally. Pick a book, dig into it, and may God bless your adventure. Let's bow our hearts. Well, Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you have given us your Word. What a precious thing that is. And indeed, Father, we do joy in praising you. We thank you, Father, you've allowed us this brief, quick survey of your precious, precious word. And Father, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are a gracious God, a merciful God, a loving God, a resourceful God. Oh, Father, how we do love you. And we thank you, Father, not only for your creation, but above all, Father, we thank you for your redemption, the extremes that you've gone to that we might live, that the, the injustices and the sin and the, the presumption and the ingratitude that characterizes us has been taken care of by the gift of of your Son. We thank you, Father. We do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit and your Word, you would increase in each of us 
an endearment, a passion for your word that we might indeed partake of it, that we might digest it, that we would meditate upon it. And in so doing, that we would grow in grace and in the knowledge of the ultimate son of David, the ruler coming to take over this planet. We do pray, Father, that you would help us to be more effective stewards of these treasures you've entrusted to us, that we would be more effective with the opportunities that you put before us as we come before you and commit ourselves into your hands without any reservations whatsoever. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we do pray. Amen.